I'm Guy and this is Guy Robot and this is the second of two really poorly shot videos about setting up my new virtual machine host which is going to have 10 different SSDs in there. We've got four NVMe and we've got six SATA. We're going to create three Z pools all together. Um, so we did the hardware setup last time. Today we're going to install Ubuntu. So I decided rather than try and film it with a shaky camera or the monitor I was going to enable SSH on the Ubuntu installer. So the only two commands I've run so far, which I'll redo now, are first of all sudo dash i to become root, then apt add repository universe, not going to run that one again, and apt update. So I ran those on the Ubuntu installer and enabled SSH server and the rest of it I'm just capturing from here, but this is a live install. So the next thing I need to do is install the prerequisites for actually installing Ubuntu manually rather than the installer. So we want to have deb bootstrap, which lets us actually kind of set up the core system, gdisk, which we're going to use today rather than parted, just to set up partitions, and ZFS in its RAMFS. So that's what's going to allow us to actually have ZFS on route. Now that's done, the next thing we want to do is see where we're going to install it. So we can see the disks we're going to use are SDA and SDC. So the next thing we need to do is clear the partition table on these disks. So we're going to do that with sgdisks zapple on dev sda. And then the same on sdc. Then we're going to create the uefi boot partition. We'll do that for sda and again We'll repeat that for SDC, because I'm having a mirror here with two identical disks. So the key thing is we want all the partitions and sizes and everything to be exactly the same. And now we're going to create the boot pool for both these disks as well. Now notice I'm using dev SDA and SDC at the moment. I will use their IDs properly when we add it to a Z pool, but for now that's just the quickest and easiest thing for me to be doing. And I'm not going to be encrypting these disks because where I am encrypting it, I'm going to be dealing with it at the actual VM level. So all I need to do now is create the main root partition on both of these as well to fill up the rest of the disks. And so there we are, we've created the final partitions for both of those. And then if we go into parted for both of these drives, we can just see nice and easily that we've got three partitions on each. We've got the 500 meg UEFI partition, then we've got the boot partition followed by the root partition for 120 gig. Next up, I do need to know the disk IDs for ZFS, so we'll do have a look in dev disk by ID. And we have a whole bunch of them here, but we know that for the boot partition for SDC, we can take that one. And for the boot partition for SDA, we can take this one. And we can see there that we've got the actual ID name for it and the partition name. It's a good idea to use this rather than just SDA or SDB because if you change how they're plugged in, SDA and B will change, but the partition IDs won't. So the next thing we want to do is actually create the Z pool itself for the boot partition which is going to be used by Grub. Now Grub doesn't support all ZFS features, so we have to explicitly enable only those that we want and no more. We're calling this one bpool. It can be any arbitrary name you want, but this is the general standard practice for ZFS on Linux. We're telling it that we want it to be a mirror rather than a single disk. If you've just got one disk, which you really shouldn't do with ZFS, but if you do, remove mirror. And then the two different partitions that we've got here, which you'll see differ only by three digits on their serial number. And then we're going to hit enter. Now we're going to do the same thing again, but this time we're going to use the bigger partition for our root pool. We're calling our pool. Again, can be anything, just fairly standard to use that for your root. And um, just as a reminder, I am not using encryption on this. You can do if you want to. There are plenty of tutorials online for that. And with that done, we are now ready to start creating the file systems. So let's create our root file system container and our boot file system containers. Now we can specify where we actually want to mount these. So we're going to have the root mounted on slash, unsurprisingly. And we're going to have the boot mounted on slash boot. And we can now ask ZFS to actually mount these. Now it's worth pointing out here that in these cases we've got no auto 
for the partitions, which is why we have to manually then do a ZFS mount afterwards. So once we've created the file systems as above, the next thing we want to do is create the ZFS data sets. So this allows us to act uh, with different policies in different areas of the disk. So for example, we don't want to necessarily delete all of our home data if we're rolling back a mistake we've got on the main operating system itself. So the key here is separating it as appropriate to your use case. I'm taking the recommended default as well as adding the varlib docker and the slash temp folder being separate within ZFS. So I'm basically just taking all of the defaults that are listed on the ZFS on Linux homepage. So we're gonna have one for slash home, we're gonna have one for slash home slash root, which is mounted to slash root. Uh, we've got var, varlib, var log, var spool, varlib docker, and temp all separately. And then we set anyone can read, write, and do whatever the heck they want in slash temp. Once this is done, it's time for us to actually install Ubuntu into our system. So we use the bootstrap. And we're putting disco on since that is the latest version we've got. I'm going to stick that into slash mount. And now this is the bit that might take a while. Now we've run the dev bootstrap, we just run one more command to finish off the core install and setup. The next thing we need to do is actually set up our Ubuntu install because we don't have a GUI for doing any of this. So everything we're going to have is in slash MNT because that is our new install. If we look at that, that's a full setup there. So we are going to edit etc hostname and I'm going to pv edi vmh02 which will be my second virtual machine host in Edinburgh. And PD Pina Vida is my consulting company who run this infrastructure. I always think it's really useful to have a uh, fairly memorable and useful way of remembering server names as after coming up with like naming themes for stuff, I forget them super quickly. And I also need to edit etc hosts. Now 127011, we are going to add stat, uh, pv edi vmh02, pv edi vmh02. And then next, I need to set up the network configuration. So we're going to add an etc netplan. Nothing in there already, so we'll call it netconfig.yaml. And we're just going to put a netplan config in there. I'm going to have a static IP address for this. If you don't want to have a static IP address, then all you need to do is put DHCP for colon yes, and pretty much get rid of everything else that's in there. So we're going to save that. Next, we need to set up our package source lists for um, apt when we're using it to install things. So etc apt sources.list. We've got one in there so far. We want to pop the rest on there. So we're setting up our, our main feed as well as the sources for it and the security and the update feeds. Now what we're going to do in a second is we are going to cruit into the environment we've created, which means it will act as if we're running it, but we're lacking a few things we need for that. We haven't got slash dev, slash proc, or slash sys within our uh, disk that we've just built because we haven't booted off it. So what we need to do is take the live CD environment and set the slash dev of that to be the slash dev in our mounted one. And now if we look at slash mnt slash dev, woohoo, we've got stuff there. Likewise, we look at mnt proc, nothing there, but If we rebind it, you'll see we've now got MNT proc there. And then as well as doing that, we need to do the same for slash sys into slash MNT slash sys. And at this point, we can actually crute into slash MNT, running bin bash with full login. And now, instead of being slash MNT, we're in slash, we're all good. We just need to update our mount points for the running system. Mm, I'm going to RM ETCM tab here and rerun that and then we can update our packages with what we've now done and then reconfigure the system after that set our locale so first of all we do an apt update which will now go and it should pull the security and the update feeds as well oh apparently i set up multiple sources so let's edit that quickly we should be able to run apt update again now we're going to configure our locale. So I put ENGB and I also always put EN US UTF-8 as well because some software complains if that isn't there in my past experience. But we're going to default to GB. 
Now we're going to reinstall Nano, because that, as you'll have noticed earlier, is missing from this environment. So we want to put Nano on here as well. Yes, I can use VR. Yes, I could probably use Emacs, but no, I'm quite happy with Nano before anyone says anything. Then we want to configure our time zone, which we is in Europe, London. <clears throat> so now it's time for us to install the kernel. So first of all, let's put the kernel itself on. So now that the kernel is done, the next thing we need to do is actually do the uh, ability to boot the kernel with the initramfs. So we're using the zfs one for that with zfs-initramfs. So we're just going to install that. And we're now ready to get grub installed. So because we've got UEFI, we need to set up the UEFI partition. So for that, we're going to need to make a FAT32 partition on our disks. So first of all, we'll do an apt install on DOSFS tools. And now I need to create the UEFI partition on both of my boot drives, because if one fails, we need to be able to boot off the other with grub. So we've done that on the first of the two 120s, and let's do it on the second one. Now we need to create a folder for our EFI partition. And next we need to know the partition UID and put it into FS tab. So I'm for now just gonna use the first of my two for this, the two devices in the mirror. We can now mount it. And we can now install the bits we need for grub. So grub EFI MD64 sign and shim sign. Right, we're ready to set a root password now. Make sure you keep this one secret. So we also want to make sure that the boot pool is always imported regardless of anything else, whether there's a cache, etc., etc. So we are going to create a new service for this. So we're going to edit the ZFS import boot pool service file. And we're going to create this from scratch. So again, this is just straight out of the ZFS on Linux page. You can copy paste this into your system. You can save that with Control X, Y, and Enter. And then we're going to enable that service that we just created. Personally, I'm going to use tempfs rather than having a static mount of slash temp. So I'm going to copy the uh, temp mounting default one and enable temp.mount here, which means that we've now got another service enabled for the temporary file system. So time to install grub. So first we're going to check that grub finds ZFS, which it does. That's good. Then we're going to regenerate with all the initRD files that we need. And the RD, the initial RAM disk, which is what actually boots the system before we actually attach to our hard disk. So we need to make sure that that's got support for everything we want. So then we need to edit the um, grub config file for support for ZFS as well. So we want to find grub underscore command line Linux default and replace Wyatt splash with specifying what our actual root port is. We give it a five second timeout just so I'm actually capable of finding it. So we'll look for timeout. We'll set that to five. We'll add a timeout on failure of five as well. Then we want to have the console as well. And then hopefully that means that if anything goes wrong, we can debug this because who knows what's going to happen in a minute. Time for us to actually update Grob's config based on what we've just done. These OS probe errors you can completely ignore. So that's good. So there we are, grub install work. Finally, we're just going to check that the grub ZFS modules are present, which they are. Perfect. So we're just going to unmount the EFI folders, and then we're going to edit the FS tab. We have to do this manually because uh, while ZFS isn't completely native to Linux in many ways, it has some weird quirks. One is with system D and what gets mounted in what order. So because some things try and race and mount things automatically, there are certain things that we're going to want to manually mount. So we're going to create the FS tab file manually for that. So we should have four entries here for the system that we've done. One is setting up our boot pool onto slash boot. And then we also want to mount var log, var spool, and temp respectively. And the rest of the system should hopefully figure itself out. Famous last words. We save that. And then the next thing we need to do is also specify those mount points as being of legacy type for ZFS. So we do it with the slash boot pool. And then we're going to do the same on var log. Fast spool and finally on slash temp. After this, we've got a fresh install. So what we're gonna do here is create a snapshot that we can roll back to when I do really stupid things in the future. And we're gonna do that on both of our boot pool and our root pool. And then we're pretty much good to go. So we wanna exit, this exit out of our crude environment back to the live CD environment. 
And then we want to kind of unmount all of these ZFS file systems that we've got in live CD. So we run a mount command to find all of the ZFS ones and we then awk that and eventually pass it to unmount. Again, you can just copy paste that from the ZFS online. And finally, we should be good to export the pool that we created. Oops, if I wasn't in that folder, we could certainly do it. Bang, job done. At this point, it's a case of wait, reboot, and hope the system comes back up. Let's find out. Dun, dun, dun. And there we have it, our first boot into the Ubuntu environment. Seems to have been successful. Ta-da! So we're back over at the main machine now because I need to create myself an account and actually set up SSH so I could do remote login. So I'm not going to bother recording too much here, but I'm just going to log in as root and create a local account and set up SSH and be back on the other. Okay, and now we're in, everything's up and running. The only thing we need to do is copy the grub install onto the secondary disks. We've done it for the primary so far. So we're gonna do that just by copying the whole of one of the grub partitions onto the other one. So we start by unmounting boot EFI. And then we have this command that's gonna read the whole of the first partition that we installed it onto and copy it onto the secondary one. So this will literally just clone the one partition to the other. Make sure you do this right. If you do the wrong thing here, you'll be wiping out the wrong partition and that would be bad. And finally, for the extra disks in our partition, we want to set it up onto the EF5 boot manager so that we're able to boot from it as well if the primary one fails. Now, now it's time to create a Zvol for the swap. So I'm going to create 32 gig one, change that to whatever size you want to have there. And then we're going to make a swap partition on the one we've just created. We are going to add that swap partition into the FS tab file. And we're going to turn off resume from hibernation. Should be an issue on a server, but good practice anyway. And finally, we can turn our swap on. So at this point, we are ready to finally upgrade the really basic stuff we've got. So we'll do an app dist upgrade to get the latest one installed. And now we are ready to install the core Ubuntu software. Um, if you want to go for a desktop one here, you do Ubuntu-desktop because it's a server. I'm just going for Ubuntu-standard. And finally, we are going to install Quemu and the KVM components and then set up some log rotate settings. So we're going to do apt install just to install the Quemu components. I'm going to use my virtualization in a minute. And the last thing we're going to do is do a little loop. That again, I'm going to copy paste from the ZFS on Linux guide. This goes through the uh, log rotate settings and removes compression from log rotate. The reason for this is that it's already compressed as a ZFS Z valve. So if we're compressing it again, we're actually wasting CPU resources and we remove some of the abilities to kind of index and deal with the file. So we basically want to turn off compression. We'll do that. That just edits all of the files where you can go and edit them more manually. And that's it, job done. So now the system is ready for me to start copying my VMs across. So there we have it. We've now got the new server set up so that we've got the ZFS on route. All I'm going to do now is go and add a couple of Z pools, one for all of the NVMe disks and another Z pool for the remaining SATA disks. So there'll be Z1 pools and then I can start copying my VMs across them. So I might do that just in another quick video following this, but we're pretty much good to go. So if we go back in the rack at last. So I know this has most been following the ZFS on Linux guide, but hopefully you found this bit useful and to have something else to go through with it. If you enjoyed today's video or you want to watch some more, then don't forget to like and subscribe and you can find me on Twitter at GuyRobotTV. Thanks.